Hi again everyone. In this presentation I'm going to show you a shooting method for certain boundary value problems involving ordinary differential equations. Now the differential equation involved is first order and the boundary conditions associated with the differential equation involve three points. Now the aim of this um, presentation is to just give you a little bit of taste, a little bit of a flavour for um, basic research. And um, the nature of this presentation is very basic in the sense that uh, a good undergraduate student would be able to follow along with uh, this presentation. So I guess this, this presentation is geared to be something like a taste of research, basic research, for an undergraduate. Okay, so firstly, what are shooting methods? Well, shooting methods um, are of interest because they have both practical and theoretical importance. So the theoretical importance when we're studying differential equations and their solutions and the boundary value problems associated with them, the um, theoretical importance is to do with the existence of solutions. Does the problem have a solution? And the practical importance, although existence is still practical, is that shooting methods uh, can incorporate numerical procedures to approximate uh, solutions to boundary value problems and differential equations. So that's a little bit of motivation, but what are shooting methods? Well, shooting methods involve relationships between solutions to boundary value problems and initial value problem. So it's like a, you know, you have a boundary value problem, you form a, um, a related initial value problem, you look at solutions to both problems and try to relate them. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to look at a, a special kind of problem known as a boundary value problem involving first order three point boundary conditions. Now, shooting methods for second order problems are well known. Uh, the applications are you know, documented well in the literature. Now, significantly less is understood in the first order case, especially where the boundary conditions are of a multi-point nature, so more than two uh, points in the boundary condition. So, that, so, so I'm going to look at first order differential equations with three point boundary conditions. And so the idea of this presentation is to partially fill that the, the gap in the literature. Okay, so the problem under consideration is the following. Okay, now by the dash here I just mean the regular ordinary derivative with uh, respect to the independent variable, in this case t. So we've got a first order differential equation, f is some known function where um, uh, it could be nonlinear, it's a function of t and x. Uh, here we've got the three point boundary condition. So a, b and c are our three points, m, n and p are constants and alpha is a constant as well. Okay, now with this problem we're going to formulate an equivalence between the number of solutions to this three point first order boundary value problem and the number of roots of a certain equation. Now just to sort of put this in a bit more context, um, one and let's just look at a special case of, of one and two. So one and two could be something like this, just, just as a basic example. Okay, x prime equals two t plus x cosine x, so that'd be the, the right hand side. And the three point boundary conditions might be something like this. Okay, so that's just a basic potential, you know, form of one, two. Okay, so we're going to formulate an equivalence between the number of solutions to this problem and the number of roots, distinct roots, of a certain uh, equation. Okay, so. In what follows, um, I'm going to define an uh, infinite strip omega to be this um, set here. So if I was to, to draw a little picture 
um, of omega. Let's say A is here, C is here, and B is, I don't know, somewhere in the middle. And this is the T axis, and say this is the U axis. Then this sort of infinite strip is your omega. Okay, so, so this is essentially going to be the domain of F in, in some sense. Okay, well, let's look at the main result. Okay, let F be continuous on this infinite strip. If there's a, const, a positive constant L, such that for all pairs of points in omega, F satisfies this condition, 3, then the boundary value problem 1, 2, our original problem, has as many solutions as there are distinct roots of this equation here. Now, this uh, x, t, uh, semicolon, s, is the unique solution to a corresponding initial value problem. You can see the differential equation is the same, and then we've got this initial condition here, x of a equals s. Now, condition 3 is a very famous condition known as a Lipschitz condition. Okay, um, it's, it's well documented in the literature. In fact, any um, standard uh, book on differential equations at you know, a higher undergraduate level will discuss this kind of Lipschitz condition. Okay, so essentially theorem 1 gives us an equivalence between the solutions to our original boundary value problem and the roots, the distinct roots, of this equation here which involves solutions to a corresponding initial value problem. Okay, so let's discuss the proof then. Right, firstly, let's discuss this point here where x T uh, semicolon S is the unique solution to this problem here. Well, it's well known that if F is... Let's consider this problem here, okay, for each S. Since F is continuous and satisfies this Lipschitz condition 3, it's well known that for each value of S, this initial value problem has a unique solution. Fold T between uh, A and C. Okay, that's again a standard um, result that can be proved in a number of ways, and uh, any serious ODE text will have that result in it. So this, uh, this problem for each S has a unique solution, which we denote by this. Okay, all right. Okay, so we're going to prove this in two parts. Um, Firstly, if S satisfies the equation 4, then X of T semicolon S will also satisfy the boundary value problem 1, 2. Well, okay, why is that true? Well, the, the, the differential equation is the same as in the boundary value problem, so this is so, so certainly 1 satisfied, and all we need to to show is that uh, 2 satisfies, the boundary conditions are satisfied. Well, okay, let's start with this, and we know by definition it's here, and if we just replace S with X of A semicolon S, then, from, from, from here, then we get the um, full holding. Uh, sorry, we get the boundary conditions to holding. Okay, now, if S1 and S2 are distinct roots of the equation 4, then we have the following. Essentially, these two solutions cannot touch, okay? This is a, um, a consequence of the uniqueness of solutions to this problem. If we have different initial conditions, then the two 
two, like let's say we have two different initial conditions, then the say two solutions cannot touch at any point um, uh, in the future or in the past. Okay, so this this is true. This is by the uniqueness of solutions. So each distinct root of four will you, will you yield a distinct solution to our boundary value problem. So that's the first half of the proof. Now let's sort of go the other way. Let x be a solution to the boundary value problem. What we want to do is show that the that um, equation four is satisfied. So from the initial conditions, it follows that x satisfies the initial value problem, 5, for this value. So essentially all we've done there is we've taken the boundary conditions, we've rearranged the uh, boundary conditions 2, we've rearranged them, and we've you know made x of a the subject, and obviously this will hold then for this value of s. Now the above value of s also satisfies, it can be shown that, that it satisfies 4. So you just take this, you replace s in here with, with this, and then you'll, you'll get everything um, uh, cancelling out. Okay, so what that means is that this value of s also yields a it is a solution to equation 4. Okay, so that's the end of the proof. And you might think, okay, well, what about this um, domain theorem? Can I sort of simplify here or, you know, extend it or, or, you know, what sort of room have I got to move on this theorem? Well, the, the significance of this assumption and the continuity is to yield the uniqueness to the initial value problem. There are lots of other um, assumptions that you can make to yield uniqueness to it, the associated initial value problem. Okay, so in this remark, what I've done is just presented a general um, concept here. The Lipschitz condition 3 in Theorem 1 can be replaced by the assumption that solutions to the IVP5 are unique. Now these are sort of more abstract assumptions, um, but if you assume that then the conclusion of uh, Theorem 1 will still hold. Okay, so here's a, um, a bibliography, a very short, just one book. Um, this is uh, the book that I got the idea for sort of transferring the shooting method to three-point first-order boundary value problems from, from Keller's book. Um, now, um, I guess the next step in this research is to talk about solutions to this problem, okay? When do solutions to this problem exist and how can we have a count on them? Now you may think, well, okay, you've shown the equivalence between two problems. Yes, what is the significance in that? Well, one significance, I, I believe, is that the analysis has actually simplified from a potentially infinite dimensional uh, boundary value problem and um, the solution space um, would be in infinite dimensional down to just some sort of equation. Now, the, the, this, this equation may be transcendental, but we may be able to, to, to more easily apply techniques to show that this has a solution or give a count on the solutions than the original boundary value problem. So that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it um, and give you, uh, and you've been given a little bit of a taste of uh, proving something new. Now, I wouldn't go as far to say that this is a you know, very significant result it kind of goes through without too much trouble, but um, considering this is aimed at undergraduates, then um, I hope you found some of this uh, useful.